Watch this. Welcome to this special edition of the 208 where we take a look at some of the art projects that we've covered over the years. Idaho was the last state in the union to build a state veteran cemetery. It didn't officially open until August of 2004 in Boise and only because of a push from then Governor Dirk Kempthorne, who just happens to have spearheaded one of the latest additions to that hallowed ground. A couple years ago, Governor Kempthorne approached Boise sculptor Benjamin Victor, a world class artist who has pieces all over the globe. Kempthorne drove Benjamin up to the cemetery, right up to the top where the road makes a loop. And he said, you know what? We need something right there in that empty space. Benjamin agreed. And with an initial investment from the former governor and his wife, Patricia, the sculptor got to work. And in the bronze, there's actually wheat that we had to cut off to mold separate. Spend any amount of time with Benjamin Victor. And one of only two statues in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And you can see the emotion he shares for his subjects. But the detail in the hair. Yeah, yeah, that was fun too, yeah. Of all the characters, the long hair and the muscles made it great to work on. From elation. Yeah, and I got to talk to Lyle. <laughs> I got to meet him. To admiration. And so Cecil, uh, he really struggled and he was kind of an unsung hero. It's that reverence that guided Benjamin to create his latest sculpture. There's never a higher calling than the military, you know, and, and being able to celebrate the service that they've done and memorialize all the, you know, the dedication they've had to, to give. He calls it, I will have your back always, a multi-generational recognition of the sacrifice and fidelity that will sit as a focal point in one of the highest points of the Idaho Veterans Cemetery. So you've got the kneeling soldier that's kneeling with his hands clasped, and he's got the dog tags of his fallen brethren in his hands and he's looking out over those graves and he's in Vietnam gear and then to his back is a female soldier with her hand on his shoulder and she's there saying I've got your back and she's in the current modern gear and she's looking out at the flag as she faces over the city as a protector. The concept may be the biggest part of this piece. I want them to walk up to the sculpture and really take a look. But Benjamin also hopes the little things get noticed too. In the stitch work and in the gear and clothing and the time that it took to create it. Especially by veterans. And that's really meaningful to them because they wore that gear. So it's more than it is just to the average person when they touch that and they come up close to it and they see the flak jacket on that Vietnam soldier, you know, as he's kneeling. That really moves them because that's the gear they wore. That's what they were in. Benjamin's been sculpting for decades and he can explain in detail what it takes to put one together. Well, first I actually weld together an armature, which is like a skeleton. From the steel start to the special patina polish. It is every tint, tone, and even some color to match the real gear and clothing. But for him, these pieces begin way before the clay is ready to cast thanks to what he was told by a mentor. Now, listen, youngster, that's what he used to call me. You, we're gonna go and we're gonna talk to all of these veterans and we're gonna get their thoughts because if you go out there and you just sculpt something because you think it's great and it doesn't mean anything to them, then that's not what we're going for. When you spoke to these veterans, what did you take for that? What did they tell you? What was the, the thing that stood out to you about what they felt? Again and again, you hear from different veterans over different eras that that camaraderie between them is what keeps them together. So to show a piece that's not only in mourning and not only in protection, but also has the connection between the two with her hand on his shoulder is really something that's special to the veterans and that's what I wanted to do for them. A few months after we did that story, that statue was unveiled and now stands at the Idaho Veterans Cemetery. I right, think of the most monumental thing to honor America's presidents. And no, it's not the extended mattress sale at the local big box store. President's Day, which was originally meant to honor George Washington on his birthday, now honors all 46 U.S. presidents. Is there a more rock solid symbol of legacy than having a bust busting out in the Black Hills in South Dakota? Mount Rushmore National Memorial started nearly a century ago thanks to one man who got his start in a small corner of the Idaho Territory. About the only thing more colossal than the 60-foot granite sculpture he created, probably the name of the man who built it, Gutzen de la Mod Borglum. Oh, it's a mouthful, which is why those who knew him called him John. 
John Gutzen Borglum, for short, was born in St. Charles, Idaho in 1967. A winter snowstorm forced his parents, who were making their way west, into a tiny log cabin near Bear Lake. The son of Danish immigrants and polygamous Mormons, Borglum became an artist, traveled through Europe, and eventually returned in the early 1900s. In 1911, he carved a huge head of President Abraham Lincoln from a six-ton block of marble. That forerunner to Rushmore was later placed in our nation's Capitol Rotunda. Then in 1927, when he was 60 years old, Borglum began sculpting the heads of Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and George Washington into the granite face of the Black Hills of South Dakota. So why those presidents? Well, the story goes, Borglum felt they represented the most important events in the history of the United States. Washington's head, representing the founding of America, was finished in 1930. Jefferson's was supposed to be a symbol of the Louisiana Purchase and had to shift to the other side of Washington because the granite wasn't so good on his right. That's why it wasn't unveiled until 1936. A year later, Lincoln, the face attributed to the abolishment of slavery, and by 1939, Roosevelt was revealed credited with clearing the way for the Panama Canal. The monument became a story of the expansion of the United States, the embodiment of manifest destiny. In all, nearly 500,000 tons of rock was removed, most of it by dynamite. Morgan didn't live to see his opus open to the public. He died in 1941 at the age of 74, about six months before completion. His son, appropriately named Lincoln, finished the final details on the National Memorial. You can find a memorial to Goots and Borglum in St. Charles, a sparse stone structure right outside City Hall. I kind of misspoke there. John was actually born in 1867 in St. Charles, which is located in the most southeast corner of the state. And there, right outside City Hall, you can find a sparse, as you heard, a structure there that kind of tells the whole story, a memorial to John Gutsum, Gutsen de la Maud Borglum. All right, still ahead on this special edition of the 2-8. If you are in downtown Boise, well, it's hard to miss this thing. We head high above with an artist as he painted the Payette River kind of vertically. Plus, we think we found Bigfoot. We're going to head out to Parma to check out to see the legend himself, see if he's been hiding in plain sight this whole time. Downtown Boise has become somewhat of a public art scene over the past several years. You have Freak Alley, you got the river sculpture in front of the Grove Hotel, all the traffic box art you see. But one of the biggest projects took place in the middle of the pandemic on one of the city's biggest buildings. We stopped by as the artist was working, not only to check his progress, but to see what inspired this mural of serious magnitude. But be warned, you may feel queasy if you kind of have an issue with heights. Downtown Boise is not necessarily wanting when it comes to works of art. Oh, they, they do pretty good. <laughs> An empty wall will inevitably, effectively get filled. There's some good stuff, yeah. And often with a freakish flair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the latest concrete canvas belongs to the Key Bank building, and it's being covered by Portland artist David Carmack Lewis, who is used to working in Boise, but only this is, if it's big. This is not just big, this is huge. It may be the 10th tallest tower in town, but it marks another first for David. When I did the water cooler mural, that was the biggest thing I'd ever done. Then I did the Fowler mural, and that was the biggest thing I've ever done. And now this is the biggest thing I've ever done, so. <laughs> it's 6,500 square feet spread out across about two dozen panels of whitewashed brick. His painting this time provoked by his last time in Idaho when he saw the Payette River. It's not a specific section of the river, but that was kind of the inspiration. I'm not really interested in just painting landscapes just for the sake of landscapes. I want there to be some other element that intrigues the viewer. That element for David tends to be inserting something that hints at humanity without actually putting in people. And it's a way of allowing the viewer to kind of insert themselves in the scene. It's just, there's a person there and anyone who looks at it could imagine being in that scene. So my work has always been kind of about describing these isolated moments uh, that to me are, are like just profoundly powerful, you know, <laughs> spaces for myself. Isolation is a fitting motif considering the moment. 
but that's not always a bad thing in David's mind. It can feel isolating if it's forced, but, but sometimes we seek it out, you know, and it's a more of a space of hope and wonder. David's space for the past few weeks has been suspended in this scaffold in solitude for seven hours a day. And fortunately, heights for him, not really a hindrance. I kind of like it, you know, it's like, it almost feels like you're like up in the crow's nest of a ship, you know? <laughs> a lookout that could make listening to the sounds of the city sort of distracting, not for David. Sometimes just doing the work, it's just like I'm focused and I, you know, my mind is just clear of thoughts and it's, it's kind of refreshing that way. You know, I enjoy the process, so it's almost like a meditation, just, just working. For some artists, putting your work out there for people to see is scarier than hanging off the side of a building. But when one's art is this hard to hide, one can only hope. Yeah, I hope they enjoy it. <laughs> I do it for me. I mean, I do something that I like. And, and I can only hope that, you know, others enjoy it too. And for the most part, people seem to, so. So to finish, he's given himself six weeks and who knows how many gallons of paint. I'm not sure because the scale is just, you know, bigger than anything I've, I've done before. So we'll see. And we'll see what he sees when he's done. There's a point where if I'm just fiddling with it, it's done. But if it looks like it's done, then it's done. <laughs> And it's done, you can check it out downtown. But check this out as well. In early 2023, the pale blue dot sculpture was unveiled on the north side of the fifth and front parking garage in Boise. It took two years to put this thing together, the whole idea, and two days to install it. John Yarnell, the artist, says the piece was inspired by Carl Sagan and the view of the Earth from the Voyager space probe. Visualizing it from a distance, seeing how insignificant we are as human beings on this planet, and that resonated with me deeply when I was thinking about this, this piece, this um, need for connection between human beings. Yarnell also told us it's not just about from where you view the piece, but also what time of day, depending on the shadows that may come across it. Perspective can change the experience entirely. He adds the color blue was used for the figures because, well, People are about 60% water, all of us. Well, still ahead on this special edition of the 208, renovating and updating a home sometimes requires taking it down to the studs. Well, wait till you see what stopped one Boise homeowner from doing just that when they started their big project. A hidden gem. That's the goal of buying a home that's a bit outdated or maybe needs some work. And that's what this mom and son duo believed they had when they bought a late 60s Boise home from the original owner in late 2021. They had no idea though how hidden their gem would be or what to do with it now. In a hot housing market, it can be hard to find something cool. Yeah, that works a lot better than the other one probably. Sometimes it takes a little work. Well, it's been really exciting to actually get hands on and be tearing stuff out of the floor. The Broats bought this Boise bench home about a month ago. This is the, actually the first house that my family had the opportunity of buying, so. The goal, to gut it, to clean it, and. Build it all back up again. About three weeks in, the cool part revealed itself. There were. Uh, when one of the back bedrooms. Exterior shingles, I think, as a creative idea. Kind of threw them a curveball. And then they were painted this dark green. So for three weeks, I've been fretting about what might be under those shingles. My mom started and she screamed from the other room and hollered. And I came in running, hoping there was not mold. And Can you believe that? I was delightfully surprised there was not mold. And uh, I was surprised, shocked, confused. I wasn't sure what I was looking at until we continued to pull down the shingles. And, found this wall of fame. Well, it is a wall, just not necessarily of fame. I mean, no offense, Dave Revering, Jack Lazorko, and Dan Schnatzetter, but if you need a Tom Needen viewer, about 1,600 two and a half by three and a half inch side-by-side -side baseball cards. We've got uh, Eric King, Dave Meads, Darnell Coles. With names and faces that certainly aren't very sentimental to Luke either. I probably could say I watched half of a baseball game in my entire life. For every Greg Maddox or Kirk Gibson, 
There's a dozen Willie Hernandez's and Jim Ackers cornered by Bob Horner. At one point, probably worth some value on their team, just not on this wall. I've looked up a few, haven't gotten lucky yet. They obviously meant something to someone at some point, more than just Major League history. I wonder if the kid put it up or the mom put it up. This wall held some mystery. To be fair, it was probably my mom's idea, but I was definitely not going to say no. Meet Chris so Nelson. Mean. I was born in 1977. I, I lived there until, I think, late 90s. So that is, that's the wall. Right? Yep. Oh, so wild. When Chris was still a kid. Yeah, 88 or 89 sounds about right. Just remember like going through them and sorting them. And he became obsessed with baseball. And so I had just a ridiculous amount of baseball cards. I would say 10 or 15,000 ballpark. Like me and my buddies, that was the only thing we spent our money on. We just had all these cards and my mom was like, well, why don't we do this? And I was game. So we spent a weekend gluing baseball cards to the wall. Just a weekend. Yeah, it only took about a weekend, yeah. It was me and her and my dad all doing it. And they were the focal point of his room for about five years, longer than the bucolic careers of Louis Meadows and Bruce Fields. And then shingles. And then shingles. Why shingles? Um, it just, I think at, the, at that point, my parents figured it was the easiest way to cover them up. So that covers the who and the how. What about the what now? I don't know. Guess we'll just have to figure that out. Um, I'd be open to ideas. I'm not sure what is next. As for Chris, he's okay with the wall remaining just a memory, a recollection of his collection. I've lived more than half my life without a wall covered with baseball cards. And not a barrier to the Broats making their own memories here. Just kind of, you know, whatever makes them happy to, to do with it. Not that they need to decide right away. Yeah, we have plenty of other work to be doing. All right, we're not done just yet. Coming up after the break, would you believe Bigfoot has been in Parma for at least the last 50 years? But why and how did he get there? Well, we'll let you know. The legend of Bigfoot goes back to before people even wrote stuff down. They were just stories passed down through the generations. You know, Idaho has a long, its own long-standing big-footed fable. There's a statue that's been standing at the site of the old Fort Boise in Parma for nearly 50 years. And if you've been over there, you know what we're talking about. It's made of cement. It's kind of depiction you might expect with the features of someone that may or may not have existed since they don't really know what he looked like. They covered all the bases. They got the barrel chest, the big feet with which he apparently took long strides. And that statue got us wondering about Idaho's Bigfoot. According to John Haley's book, The History of Idaho, Bigfoot was six foot eight, weighed 280 pounds, and a footprint that measured nearly 18 inches long. Not quite shack size, but still big enough to be Bigfoot. That's the only part of the story that remains true through all of the versions of Idaho's Bigfoot. Oh, and he was also apparently the namesake of one Treasure Valley city. Well, there was a, a chief by the name of Bigfoot, a uh, chief Nampa, with a town named after him, I don't know. There's a lot of unknowns about Idaho's Bigfoot. Will we ever know? Probably not. <laughs> did he have big feet? Uh, some say that he did, yes. Allegedly 17 and a half inch footprints, and he was 6'6", six, six, or maybe he was 7'6", or who knows exactly, but he was a big guy. And his name would appear, historian Rick just says, anytime white settlers didn't do well in a battle. He was this huge Indian. Nobody could have done anything about it. He was just huge. So that was the story. That was the story. And he couldn't be stopped because he was so big. Exactly. And there were, were people that were killed and horses that were stolen and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and those things did happen. Of course they did. Uh, was this single Indian uh, involved in every one of those incidents? Probably not. In fact, this single Shoshone morphed into an amalgamation of many. There's the chief named Nampa. Then there's another Shoshone by the name of Howluck, who was involved in the Snake War and who Idaho State Historical Society says is the real Bigfoot. Or there's the other Bigfoot, who was one-fourth Cherokee and whose story was told in the Idaho Statesman in 1878. Yes, yes, it was, it was quite, uh, l let's say, incredible. It was a 10-year-old, third-hand, rather extravagant account of an encounter of how and when the terror of Idaho was killed. 
This person reported to the statesman that someone he knew told him the story about how that someone met Bigfoot in the Hawaii's and there was a shootout. And uh, he, he shot Bigfoot 16 times. And then he was, he was going to die. So he took that opportunity to tell about a two-hour story about his life, as one would, of course. And that seems far-fetched to you. Uh, it does. <laughs> uh, part of it is because the gentleman who, who uh, uh, allegedly told this story never mentioned it in any of his own papers. That gentleman gunman was allegedly John Wheeler, seeking the $1,000 reward for Bigfoot. However, he never collected it, so and no proof it even happened. You know, there was yeah. no, no body, there was nothing like that. Just one of those good stories. So according to you and your research, there's no definitive explanation for a Native American, Shoshone, Paiute, whichever, Bannock, there's no explanation or even evidence that he existed. There really isn't, I, I, I've never seen any. There are stories, but stories are stories. Yet we have a statue that says this guy was real. Yes, yes. Well, the Bigfoot statue was dedicated by Governor Cecil Andrus in August of 1974. You know, there's a lot of details we didn't even get into, like why there was a $1,000 bounty on Bigfoot's head, which apparently comes from the many coach and wagon robberies, and the killings Bigfoot did during his time in the Treasure Valley. A lifestyle that stemmed from him allegedly being turned away by the father of a girl Bigfoot fancied. So why that money was never claimed? Well, John Wheeler was also an outlaw. And according to the criminal code, one outlaw did not collect bounty on another. The best part of all this, no way to know if any of this is true, but it would certainly be cool if it was. All right, thanks so much for joining us for this special edition of the 2A.